Welcome to our Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. Um, before we get to the program and, and introducing um, Emily Dickens, who's our student who will moderate the discussion with Jonas, I want to quickly introduce, introduce and welcome um, Cornelia, who runs the um, Keller Center at Princeton University. Um, our speaker today, Jonas, is a graduate of Princeton, and um, Cornelia and the Keller Center were nice enough to be our co-sponsors today. So Cornelia, I was hoping you can say hi, maybe talk a, a, for a few seconds about the Keller Center before we get into the program. Sure. Uh, so I know that um, we're really waiting for the program to kick off, so I'll keep my, my, my comments really brief. I want to thank you, uh, Mike, for the opportunity to co-host this. I know we've been in touch for years now. Uh, I remember you came down and gave um, more panelists on, on, uh, at, at Princeton uh, years ago, so really appreciate the connection. Um, so my role, I think, is very similar uh, to Mike's. Uh, I am the executive director of our innovation center on campus called the Keller Center. And we have both um, courses and co-curricular programs uh, and certificates, which are like minors at other universities, and uh, are really excited uh, about um, hearing from real thought leaders uh, out there. Uh, so Jonas, thank you so much. We're really excited to hear from you. And, and uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure there are many people that are really looking forward to what you have to say. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I'm excited to uh, share what I know. Great. Well, thanks, Cornelia. So, so, Jay, this is your welcome back to campus at Princeton and then your, your second campus home of Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Um, let me introduce uh, Emily Dickens, who is a great um, student. She's currently in our master's in engineering management program, is also a graduate of our undergrad as a chemical engineer, and she is going to moderate the program. For those that are in our Zoom session or are watching on Facebook Live, if you want to ask a question, for Jonas, you can put it um, on Zoom right in our sort of chat, or you can put it on Facebook and we'll make sure we get it in here and um, we'll have an hour together. So let me turn it over to Emily. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Emily. And uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in and thank Jonas for being here as well. So um, like Michael said, if you have any questions, we encourage you to put them in the chat and um, I'll make sure to ask them. Um, so I guess to start off, Jonas, why don't you give us like a little bit of background and uh, your career path that has led you here? Uh, well, uh, as Michael mentioned, I graduated from Princeton in the early 90s um, and went to go work for Harvey Weinstein at Miramax. Uh, that, he was my first boss. He's a great guy. Don't listen to the press. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so I worked at Miramax for a few years and learned enough about the sort of ins and outs of how the business worked that I realized that the fastest way to do what I really wanted to do, which was direct, was to write. So after having worked at Miramax a little bit, I wrote a screenplay that led to a movie getting made. That movie got into Sundance. That got me an agent. They asked me if I had written anything else. I had written another little screenplay. That movie got made and got, and got into Venice, and that kind of got me going. And then eventually I, came, I started working in TV. And as I worked more in TV and less in independent film, the sort of age of peak TV has kind of swelled up around the time that I've been working in it. And now um, it's a lot easier to get more work done in television, honestly, than in film because they just make a lot more of it. Gotcha, yeah. Um, so you have a new show on Netflix that dropped today for those yeah. who haven't known. You guys are all up at 3 a.m., right? Watching <laughs> it out. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk about, uh, you mentioned a couple of places in your journey, um, working in independent film and um, network TV as well as Netflix. Um, do you want to talk about how those environments uh, are different from one another and your work there, how they uh, differed? Sure. Well, uh, you know, in the early 90s, when I first started working, uh, that was the heyday of Sundance. And so um, indie film was a great way to break in and lots of great movies got discovered at Sundance and then, um, you know, went on to more mainstream success. And it was a great way to sort of break in and get discovered. I think that's harder now. I think that the path through independent film is trickier because it's harder for those films to become successful. And with so much television going on, it seems like that's an, an easier path now than, like I think if I was a graduate now, I would try to start working in streaming television rather than, you know, 25 years ago, independent film was an easier path. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so 
More specifically on like the Netflix versus network side, how has um, production changed for you or um, uh, promoting uh, your TV series? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, working with Netflix, they've had, um, you know, when they started and they went to all these companies and asked them for their content so that they could put it online, most of the companies signed off on that because it was an, a, a new income stream and they were sort of felt like they were getting money for something they couldn't exploit themselves. And then as Netflix has grown in stature, all those companies have pulled their content back and starting their own streaming services, you know, Apple TV and, and Amazon. And so they've all started to, so Netflix suddenly has this content problem. They had all this content that they had licensed from other places that they've now lost. So they needed to make a, not, a lot more new content in order to satisfy their customers. And in doing that, I, what was interesting with Netflix is they just didn't have the layers of bureaucracy that traditional networks had. You had a lot more autonomy and creative freedom, frankly, just because I think they had a volume problem that they just couldn't monitor everything as closely as they network. Plus they also have um, unlimited shelf space. You know, they can, a network may only have Thursday night at eight available. So there's lots of focus on that time slot. Netflix has an unlimited number of opportunities. So um, it, it's, it's easier, I think, to, to break through there. Gotcha. Um, so as your career has developed, what are some things that um, you've looked for in previous projects and uh, you look for now as you're um, developing new projects? Hmm, you know, I'd love to say that I was wiser about that, but I'm not sure that I am. Um, I mean, it always sort of comes from the same place. I mean, I think you have to be, it's, it's so hard and the odds are so against you that you have to have a certain level of passion for what you're doing and be drawn to it. Otherwise, the, long, the road is just too long and hard. So I, I, from that standpoint, it hasn't really changed that much. It's just, I tend to just do things that I think I would like, basically. Gotcha, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> um, and so do you have anyone like through your career that you've really looked up to that has acted as a mentor to you um, through all of it? I do. I had a, um, on my, the second movie I made was a little movie called Deceiver. Michael Berg was helping out on that one. And um, uh, we had a cinematographer on that who actually was the cinematographer on Jaws and on The Godfather. So he was, this, and he was in his mid seventies at the time. Um, and he had just seen a lot of incredible filmmakers and had been around the business for a long time. And he became a dear friend and gave me lots of good advice. And he's still alive and still makes movies and he's well into his nineties. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, he, he is. He's an amazing guy. His name's Bill Butler. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as this is an entrepreneurship series, um, how would you say that entrepreneurship in show business differs than entrepreneurship in other industries? Hmm. Well, I mean, every time you come up with a project, and I know um, it's, a, it's a form of entrepreneurship, I guess, in that you, you have to um, present something and get uh, investors, essentially, like a studio or Netflix, to back you and give you the ability to share it on their platform. Um, so in that way, it's, it's super, uh, similar and you have to do a lot of, uh, creative work before you get paid, which I'm sure is also like being an entrepreneur. You do a lot of work before you can actually sell your product or bring it to the world. So it's the same thing. You, um, as uh, the, the more I've done it, the more polished, uh, the pitches that I brought to studios become you, because you realize what works and what doesn't. And you really work, you know, you, you, it's almost like you create a deck for, for Outer Banks. I shot a trailer, you know, I did a little fake trailer. I hired a bunch of um, kids locally and put together uh, a kind of a, a visual um, uh, mood piece so that you could understand what the show is going to feel like when you saw it. Um, and then really polishing the pitch to the point that it, it, it feels like it's casual conversation, but it's really not. It's really almost scripted and memorized in your head when you go in there. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, so going to Outer Banks, uh, what so uh, what inspired you to do this project? Um, and can you describe a little bit of that process um, since it's your most recent work? 
Well, um, you know, I, ha I had two partners on this. One was a guy who had not worked in film or TV. Uh, he was a novelist. And one was my brother, who I'd worked with a lot. And so um, the three of us uh, had always loved these different kinds of coming of age pieces, like um, uh, The Outsiders. We adored The Outsiders, both the book and the movie. Um, uh, and just stories of, of people sort of rounding the curve from youth to adulthood. And then we knew um, the environment of the coast of Carolinas really well because we you know, had grown up and spent a lot of time there. So we felt like we had some authority to speak to what that was like. Um, so we started to work out a pitch and work out the central story. I mean, the way it usually works is that you, you, you come up with the pilot story and you sort of boil that down to a 20 minute pitch. And then you also know what the season arc is going to be, what's going to, the leaves at the end of the season are going to be, and then whatever visual um, presentation you want to present. And so we took a couple months to do that. Um, and then we called up our agents and said, okay, we're ready to go pitch. And what they do is they'll set meetings for studios all over town. So we were going to pitch uh, HBO and Showtime and Hulu and basically all the outlets that you guys know and, and your families watch. And in the course of about two days, you run around all over Los Angeles uh, peddling this idea. Um, and the hope is to try to get more than one place to bid on it. Um, so we were lucky. We had uh, uh, two places that wanted to make it. We went with Netflix because we felt like there was more opportunity there. Um, and then the next step is, and this is different than the way some uh, traditional uh, broadcasts networks do it is net, uh, Netflix just ask you to write the pilot script. So you write the first story. It's like a 60 page document. And if they like it, they'll green light the season, which is kind of great because you can go straight into it. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if you're sell, if you sell a show to NBC, you have to make the pilot first. So you write the first script, then you make the pilot, then they decide. So this sort of eliminates that interim step, which, you know, the fewer steps to being on air, the better. So that was basically the process. All right. Um, so it looks like we have a question from uh, Amy Young. Um, Amy, would you like to ask your question live? Oh, sure, I can. Hello, <laughs> Hi. everyone. Wonderful to meet you. Yeah, nice um, to meet you. Very cool. Jumping into this question. So I've read previously that if you sign on to do work with a streaming service, that your production schedule gets really condensed, more condensed than it might be if you're doing independent work. Um, I was wondering, if this is true, number one, um, have you been asked to amend anything that you've written to fit a production schedule? And then are there any tips or tricks or guidelines to sort of deciding what you're willing to go to bat for and what you can be more flexible on? I mean, this, this is, that's a, a great question. And the short version is, is that especially in uh, an episodic show like Outer Banks, you, they'll give you basically an overall budget per episode. Now, some places will micromanage you so that each episode has to hit that number. But other places will say, here's the overall number. In our case, it was 55 million. They were like, you're going to do 10 episodes for $55 million. They let us move the money around. So if one episode costs more, that's fine, as long as the next episode costs less. What I've found is it's to, your, it's to your great advantage to be on budget because there's, there's certain intangibles that will affect whether or not you're gonna get a second season. You know, one of it is gonna be um, uh, what the fan base is like, the critical response. Are you on budget? Are you a problem? Like I can tell you lots of horror stories at Netflix of other shows that went wildly over budget, fighting for things that they believed in. But what happened was is their orders were shortened. So instead of doing 10 episodes, they did nine. So, uh, you know, the best thing to do is to understand, and you know, 55 million is a lot of money. That's like, you can make it for 55 million. So I've, I've found your best bet is to figure out what, how much money they're gonna give you and try to stay inside the lines. Gotcha. Okay, um, uh, Stacy, would you like to ask your question next? Thank you. Am I unmuted? No, you're talking. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you <don't hear> me? <laughs> uh, so I was just curious, Jay, you said you worked with your brother on this. Um, did you all uh, share all the duties equally or did one of you focus more on business versus the creative side? How did that go? Because in a lot of just 
typical business partnerships um, working together, having two like co-CEOs can be a very difficult challenge. Well, that's a good question, Stacey. Like, um, we did have different areas, different little fiefdoms. Basically, I handled everything on set, sort of physical production. So I would manage the other directors and help make those production decisions to help us stay on budget and basically shoot the show. So I would hire the crew. We had about a 70-person crew, pick the DP, the production designer, all that stuff. And Josh and Shannon uh, basically were responsible for the scripts. And so they would write the scripts, I would get the script shot, and then all of us would sort of edit it together. That's, that was the rough version. Every now and then I'd have to help on scripts or they would have to help out on set, but in general, that's kind of how we did it. Um, okay. It's really labor intensive. You know, when you're in production, it's 18 hours a day. I mean, if it wow. even gets a shot, it's, it kind of blots out everything else. So that's why I miss roommate reunion sometimes if we're in production. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but um, so you, so it helps to have partners because there's al there's almost more work than a single person can do. Um, Bill Watterson, would you like to ask your question next? Yeah, uh, I was just wondering for all the um, the proof of concept materials, the the teaser trailers, the decks, what, what for 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 not necessarily just for this project, but for other projects. Yeah. Do you do you look to partner with a production company first, or maybe use their resources or their you know their their finances um, to create these materials, or do you go out of pocket and then go directly to the buyer to the network? That's a good or is question. it different from project to project? I think it's sort of different from project to project. I think um, uh, in my experience, I found being to having a, an idea attached to a big producer beforehand tends to slow things down. Like that for me, I've done it that way, but it hasn't, the, the ultimate success rate is not greater and the, but the work, the sort of, the, the interim steps go up. So for me, I prefer to not bring those on. And more notes. Yeah, it's just more notes. It's just more meetings. And then, yeah. then it gets sort of watered down. And, 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 you know, this goes into the business of Hollywood a little bit, but often what you're, when you get put with producers like that, it's at the behest of your agency, which is really serving their relationship with that heavyweight producer. And it has less, it has less to do with the project itself and your particular career. So what I've realized is that you're sort of the, you're sort of the pawn of the agency when you do that. So for me, I've decided to just sort of go it alone. And after years, especially I live in North Carolina now and I am tight with the local film community. So, you know, most of these, these folks are my friends. So we just shot a new trailer for another idea. And basically I just pulled together a bunch of buddies that I had and, you know, we shot it over three days and, you know, I, anything that came up, I just paid for out of pocket, but just did it myself. And then do you, if I may follow up, do you then, uh, in terms of your working relationship with your agent, you give them the completed materials. Do you give them your target list, your wish list, or is that where they, do they take over from there? Or is it very collaborative in terms of, it's I know I want to target these four or five places, any other names you want to bring to the table? Pretty collaborative. You know, they have their ear to the ground and they often know what's been sold. So let's say you have an idea about teens on the coast of North Carolina and you go to pitch it and they go, well, guess what? Netflix just bought one of those. So we don't need to go there. So they can sort of help shape the list, but, um, but they, you know, there's only a limited number of buyers really. So you're pretty, you pre you're pretty willing to go to all of them. Um, right. And they'll, and they'll often, they'll give an introductory call to their contacts at the, at those, at, that those buyers that are out there. And not every place will be open to hearing your pitch. Like if they just bought a young adult series that's too similar, like I'm saying, they'll say, you know, I'll never be able to buy that. So don't even waste your time. So the, the, the list sort of winners itself naturally. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a question from Katie asking, do you have tips for uh, getting distribution for documentaries? Um, you know, I think, I mean, just to speak about Netflix, Netflix has been incredible for documentaries. Um, they've been a huge buyer for documentaries. I mean, Tiger King is the most recent example of, mm -hmm. I mean, it, when was the last time a documentary had that kind of cultural effect? Um, 
So, I mean, I think the streaming services are great places to do it. And I think if you asked people to go to a theater to see Tiger King, they probably wouldn't do it. And it certainly would be too long. I mean, it was what, seven episodes or something like that. Um, so I think uh, selling documentaries to streamers is definitely the, the best way to do it. So whether you get it into a festival and the streamers see it there, or you find another way to approach them directly, um, it'd be a good way to do it. And they seem to be buying, so. Yeah. Um, okay, another question uh, from Amy. Are there particular plot elements, tropes, or archetypes that seem popular right now? Um, or any story types that people should avoid pitching right now? I, you know, there's, you know, do you remember maybe 15 years ago in Hollywood when two movies about a giant asteroid came out at the exact same time? You know? <laughs> Like, in other words, there are all, things always bubble up and there's probably someone who has an idea similar to this idea you love that's already out there. So one thing I've learned over time is to just ignore that. It's like, the, there's lots of, there's m lots of uh, minefields out there and it's almost simpler just to walk straight than it is to go crazy zigzagging trying to avoid them. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. uh, if you love something, passion matters more than you know, whether or not somebody's bought that. Every now and then, the agents every year try to tell you like, oh, don't, they're not buying um, anthologies or make it serialized and not um, episodic. And I don't think any of that matters. I think just go with something you love. You got a better shot. Um, and following up, uh, outside of New York and LA, are there uh, some other US um, locations that are surprisingly fertile film hubs? Well, there's probably more shows being shot in Atlanta than in any other place in America. I think there's 60 shows being shot in Atlanta. Um, uh, so it's super busy, but these regional film spots pop up wherever the tax credit is the greatest, basically, is the short version. Usually without regard to whether or not the show should be shot there. If you look at what places produce the most shows and then overlay which states have the best tax credits, it's gonna be almost exactly the same. And like in North Carolina, we've had some trouble where uh, in 2016, the state legislature passed um, a non-inclusive law called HB2 that asked people to go to the bathroom in the gender of their birth. So that created a giant uproar and, it's, and there's still pieces of that law still on the books and that's why we couldn't shoot in North Carolina for Outer Banks, even though that's what the Outer Banks obviously is. We had to shoot in South Carolina, that bastion of liberalism. So, um, uh, it, you know, it really follows the tax credits, I would say. Um, so do you have uh, any advice for young filmmakers out there? Right. Right. That's the only way out of the ghetto, out of the film ghetto, is to write. It's, that's the fastest, it's the only piece of, that, it's the only property that you can completely control where you trying to go get a job is not sort of arbitrary and dictated by many things that are outside of your control. So if you write something and someone likes it enough to want to, to make it, then you have a shot to become the director, to be the producer, to do whatever. So. I think everyone I talk to who is interested, I say the best, the, the best way to get to wherever you want to go is to write. Um, it looks like Kate Goldberg has a question next. Bring it on, Kate. Hi, Jay. Hi. Um, how has the coronavirus affected your show now and for the future? Um, good question. I just had a call with Netflix about this yesterday. So. Obviously production, like a lot of things worldwide has shut down and Netflix is, are, is trying to figure out how they're gonna come back up. What I think is gonna happen is sets are gonna be closed. They'll be completely closed sets in the future. I think we'll all be wearing gloves and masks. I think there'll be minders on set that try to um, enforce social dis distancing. I think there'll be hand washing. Um, uh, you know, there'll be tiny little hand washing sinks set up on set that will ask people, you know, if you've ever been on a film set, there's craft service, which is kind of this giant buffet that everyone can kind of graze while we're working. That will change and all become individually wrapped uh, food items. Like all those little things will change. Um, uh, those, are, those, are the, those are the main 
things. And but when we go back is right now they're saying we probably can't go back into sort of pre-production until July and probably can't shoot until August. So it's going to be a while. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, you had a follow-up? Yes, I wanted to ask a follow-up. Um, no, it's interesting. I, I remember when we were last together, when you were talking about this April date, and now everybody's at home. So obviously the, the, the benefit of dropping a show when the world is sheltering in place, maybe talk about, I mean, what, what, I mean, hey, no one wished this upon anyone, but what does it mean to launch a show now when the world is at home? I think if you can't succeed now, you get, you're in trouble. <laughs> I think um, I think there's so many people, you know, I'm sure you guys have read articles about uh, streaming and how much it's gone up. I read something that Netflix is up like 30%. So for, for just, and the way Netflix analyzes whether or not a show is popular is whether or not it's watched to completion. That's what, that's the number one thing they want you to watch. They want you to binge the whole thing. Um, so, you know, having something like this where everybody is home and trapped and even after they've done their schoolwork or work and gone out and got some exercise, there's still plenty of time left. It's definitely a, a, a fortunate time to be bringing a series out for sure. Can I ask one quick follow-up while, while I have the mic? Um, I mean, you're, you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you know, th this is a series around entrepreneurship and there's been some great questions about some of the dynamics of um, the business of, of entertainment, um, you know, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, you and your brother are sort of, you've got your own shingle out there. I mean, do you think of yourself as an entrepreneur as well as sort of being a, a sort of creative sort of filmmaker? I mean, how, how do you, when you hear the term entrepreneur, do you think of yourself in that, in that way? Well, I do. And I think it's like, especially for something that we're trying to do now, which is, um, you know, we produced this one young adult series for Netflix and we want to produce two or three YA series for Netflix and build a kind of mini, a mini studio here in North Carolina. So um, that's why I shot this other trailer. Um, there's other aspects like, you know, after many years of just being a filmmaker trying to peddle his, his wares, I'm also trying to broaden that into developing this potential small studio that would shoot. I live in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a small regional film hub. They've shot lots of movies you've seen here. Iron Man 3 was one that shot recently here. Um, but um, so yeah, so it, it can bleed into more traditional ideas of entrepreneurship and that's something that we're trying to build. Um, you know, Bill, when you asked about producers um, and people who have shingles, sort of these overall deals at a studio, like. If you're a if you're a um, freelance artist like I am, if you can get an overall deal at a studio, that's sort of the holy grail. Where you know they sign you up for like a three year deal, you can um, produce more than one project at once. You can bring in other colleagues that you can work with, um, and that can certainly lead to other entrepreneurial opportunities. So, um, you know, the first thing you have to do is you have to get it the, some, the first thing on the air. But if it succeeds, you can you can branch out from there. Um, Adrian, would you like to ask your question live? Sure. Um, sorry, I don't have video right now. Um, I hopped on late, so I'm not sure if anyone already asked about this, but I was curious if you had any advice on pivoting careers into entertainment um, or any way to build skills that can be leveraged later into the entertainment industry. Sure. I think, uh, do you know what uh, career you would like in entertainment? I think that's the, the first thing to sort of isolate or just do you, do you just mean it in generally generally but um if any specifics more in the acting side of things oh as far as acting is um you know i think i mean it goes back to that um piece of advice that i was talking about earlier even if you want to be an actor i think writing would be the best way to start because it's some you can create something for yourself to star in and the, the ability to make things has gotten so much easier. When I first started, you actually needed film stock and these big cameras and you had to develop it. And there was a certain cost associated with making anything. But now, I mean, you've got guys like Steven Stoder Soderbergh shooting movies off iPhones. Like literally anyone can make a movie for almost nothing. And so if I were young and wanted to get into acting, I would write things for myself to act in. And, um, 
as well as being willing to move, I mean, to Los Angeles, because the, the, the next piece of that, if you want to be an actor, is you have to become known to the casting directors. And the only way to do that is to go to a place where they cast a lot of people like LA and um, meet them in person. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, so we have another question from Stacy asking about the first episode of Outer Banks. Were you lucky enough to have a hurricane shooting? Well, not lucky enough, but <laughs> shooting when the first episode happened or how did it happen? Uh, the fallen trees and overturned boats were very convincing. Oh, well, we, well the, that was all manufactured. Either it was a physically fake tree that we made, like the, the, the main, you guys haven't seen it probably, but the main uh, location for our young crew is this um, sort of shack out on the water and there's a hurricane in the aftermath. A lot of the trees in the yard are knocked down. That was all just made by our art department. And then the things like the boats further in the deep background, that was all visual effects. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so the cast of your, um, of Outer Banks is fairly new actors that haven't um, been featured in a lot of previous works that seemed like, um, how did you go about casting for uh, the show? We have, you know, you, we, ca we hired casting directors um, in New York and LA and Australia and North Carolina. And especially um, with things like Zoom, uh, auditions now take place remotely. Whereas before, you know, it's easier to be discovered in a far flung place than it used to be. So you, there's something called um, the breakdowns where every role that's available to an actor comes out to actors agents. And so they ask all their acting clients to put themselves on tape and they put them up. And then your casting director, your main casting director sort of vets these thousands of submissions and will winnow it down to sort of 20 contenders. Our casting directors were the, the, um, the women who cast Mad Men, so they had good taste and they help narrow it down. And then you wanna come and meet um, the actors that you're interested in in person. Um, mm -hmm. You sort of have callbacks that goes through several rounds. And then you, um, once you sort of start to win things down, you will bring in one character that you think is gonna play JJ and another character you think is gonna play Sarah and you do chemistry reads. We actually, the, the actor who plays JJ was initially cast for the lead. And a week before we started, we did a chemistry read uh, with the female lead and there was zero chemistry. Like it was just <laughs> as dead as it could be. And so we thought, hmm, maybe we need to rethink this. So we slid him over to the JJ role and then we found uh, our lead actor, this, this young, young guy named Chase Stokes and he worked a lot better. Gotcha. But there's a, there's a kind of alchemy to all that. Um, so can you explain what a chemistry read exactly entails, what it, what it is? <laughs> Well, you literally, you, you just, I mean, uh, you get scenes from uh, your scripts and you give it to the actors, you let them prepare, and then you'll just go in a more casual environment. Like we literally did it in the apartment that I was renting in Charleston um, and we filmed it, you know, we had a camera there mm -hmm. and we just let the actors sort of um, work with one another and you sort of don't overcoach it. You just sort of let it evolve and see how they respond to one another and see how they interact. Do they feel stilted? Does it feel naturalistic? Do they feel believable? Do they like each other? Is there actual chemistry underneath the scene? Is there any real chemistry happening? Cause that helps. And, um, and you just kind of have to go with your gut about whether or not they can bring life to a certain role, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you have an answer for this question, but, uh, as you were talking about earlier, there are a lot of new streaming services, um, coming around. And so how would you say Netflix is staying competitive against other giants such as, uh, Apple and Disney? Um, I, I think they've just got more content and they had a big, they had a big lead. You know, I wonder about things like, like Peacock, which is about to come online, which is NBC's, the, the broadcast network NBC's version of a streaming series. Mm -hmm. Part of me wonders who's going to sign up for that, you know? And I think, uh, right. I mean, maybe, I, I, it's just, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that people love The Office and they'll watch reruns of that, but um, it'll be interesting to see. I think the people with the big, big pockets will be the biggest competition. So that'll be Amazon and Apple. 
Gotcha. Over time, yeah. Um, Ella, would you like to ask your question live? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, so Outer Banks seems like came out all at once. Um, my question is, did you shoot still episode by episode or did you shoot the whole, like get all the scripts together at once and then shoot the whole thing at once or by location? Um, yeah, and do you have a preference in that regard? Also? I mean, it's always more efficient if you have all the scripts uh, completed before you start shooting, but that's, that's sometimes hard to do. I think we we had seven of them finished before we started. We needed warm weather, so we had the winter before we started shooting last summer to write because we were just waiting for it to get warm. Um, but most shows usually go in with about four scripts written. It just, it, it sort of, it varies, but that's sort of the average. So while you're shooting, they're still writing. Um, the more scripts you have, the more efficient the production can be. But sometimes you have to shoot out a, out a sequence. Like we're, we're already writing season two and there's a section that's gonna take place in the Caribbean. So even though the, that, part that takes place in the Caribbean is going to be in the first few episodes of the second season. We're going to shoot that at the end of the second season. So you, you often have to juggle things just to make it make sense for your production. Um, but the more scripts you have finished, the better produced it's going to be. That's for sure. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Adrian. Uh, what are your thoughts on Quibi and how uh, the way that content is consumed may be changing? Uh, how does that shift your work? You know, I think it, it, I, my gut feeling on Quibi is it's not going to work. And, and the problem is, is that short form dramatics are hard. And and maybe I'm not a millennial, so maybe I'm not, I'm not as open to watching something in 10 minute bursts. But when I first heard that, my just spider sense was like, I don't think that's gonna work. So, and I'll be interested, I'm sure I could be proven wrong. Jeffrey Katzberg and Meg Whitman have amazing track records and are much smarter than I am. But um, as, an, as an artist, I don't wanna write something that I have to finish in 10 minutes. So it, it, for as an artist, I would resist that. I, would, I don't, I don't want to go do that. So I just feel like those stories would be so truncated and clipped that I wouldn't want to, you couldn't get any narrative momentum going. So anyway, I'm short and quibby. <laughs> um, uh, another question that was received is, if you got the opportunity to remake a classic, which would you go for? Well, that's a really good question. Mm to remake a classic. I think that's sacrilege on some level, but let me think about that. <laughs> um, hmm. Probably some Westerns, just because, uh, you know, maybe some spaghetti Westerns, because those actually feel kind of dated. But um, just, and because, you know, part of the, the great thing about the uh, filmmaking industry is that you get to go do interesting things and different things every day. And as I've gotten older, you realize part of the joy of that is the process. So when we were working on Outer Banks this summer, at one point we, were, we had worked outside for 47 straight days without a single interior scene. And we were always on boats and we were all, every day was some different challenge that was inter interesting. So when you ask me a question like a classic to remake, I would think of something like, oh, like how about Lost Horizon? You know that movie? Um, about the guy who finds Shangri-La in the Himalayas. It's actually kind of a shaky movie. But, um, but that would be a fun one because you could go shoot in the Himalayas. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, we have a question from a friend offline. Um, can you comment on North Carolina as a place to live doing what you do? Um, do you feel at a disadvantage being there versus a place like LA? Um, how much time away from North Carolina do you spend for work? Um, you know, this is the, the, the dirty secret of a career in film is that you often have to go to far-flung uh, locations and it's tricky on family life to, to manage that. Um, it's definitely, um, you, I think when you're early in your career, it helps to go to Los Angeles to make connections, but at a certain point, I don't think you have to stay there. Um, in North Carolina, there is a, a serious film community. You know, there's lots of, there's two TV shows that shoot in the small town that I live in. Um, uh, and I think if you have a small community around you that can help you make trailers and, you know, make 
um, promotional materials that you can help sell it, but you're definitely going to have to spend part of your life in LA no matter what, if only to go. Like even, even in, when, when we posted Outer Banks, I would have to go to LA to, to do all the mixes and to do all the final edits. There's just part of it that there's no way to not be in Los Angeles. So um, it's, a, it's definitely a little bit of a life on the road. Like um, I probably spent three years shooting in Vancouver if I added it all together which is another popular shooting location because they have great tax credits and there's a currency situation that the studios exploit. So, um, uh, but that can be an upside too. So, cause you get to go and travel to interesting places, but um, it's tricky. I would say go to, if you're not going to be in LA, go to a place where there is some kind of film community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a question from uh, Todd was what, has the incredible influx of available funding for content done to the competitive dynamics for content creators like yourself? Well, it's, you know, it's unbelievably competitive. Um, uh, you know, when you walk into the Netflix lobby, for example, um, you'll walk in and there'll be 40 group, there'll be 40 groups of people waiting to pitch and, mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll look across the room and it'll be famous actors that you recognize and producers that you've heard of or directors that you've heard of. So um, there is more content, but there's more people competing. So I don't, I don't know if it's easier. Um, uh, and it's more global. So you're competing against um, folks from all over. So, um, uh, you know, there's upside that there's more jobs. The downside is there's more pe people trying to get those jobs. So I think, and I think that's the way it's always been. It's hard, mm -hmm. you know, you get it, you have to have a thick skin and if you get it pushed, if you get thrown off by a rejection, it's going to be a long road. You have to be able to just take a no and keep on trucking. Uh, we have another question from Amy. Um, how do you vet a producer? Uh, Amy, would you, are you asking that as far as the line producer goes? Because producer is a pretty amorphous term. It can mean a lot of different things. Um, if you're speaking about the line producer, which basically that's the kind of field general on a, on a production who helps allocate all the money and makes all the trains run on time. And for me, that's an incredibly important relationship. And when I interview those folks, I, I, I feel like I have to have a level of trust so that when they tell me we're at a certain place in our budget, there can be no buffer. I just want the absolute truth. Tell me exactly where we are as best as you know. Don't fudge it, don't spin it, and I'll help you manage the budget. So having a level of trust is incredibly important. Um, the other thing I think if it's a producer, like an executive producer, you know, like, um, like a JJ Abrams. I did a, a series with Alfonso Cuaron and JJ, and they were both producers on the series. Um, and they can help you with your, with your interactions with the studio by bringing their clout to it. They also can help you with creative advice. But I think if, if you're working with someone in that role, you also have to be able to um, advocate for what you believe in creatively and they have to stand down. Because if you're just working for someone who's just gonna tell you exactly what to do and when to do it, for me, that's not, as, that's not as the, a, a position I'm really interested in. So I, I, you want someone who feels like a partner and not a boss basically. Uh, so going off of that, within that partnership, if there's uh, creative differences or conflict, how do you handle that? Well, there's that famous William Goldman line, nobody knows anything, because <laughs> you're talking about, it's really just opinion. So yeah. there's no right or wrong. It's not a math problem. So um, you, you know, you get in, I get in healthy creative arguments with my partners all the time. And uh, we're lucky because we are a triumvirate, so we basically can, there's never a tie. So we really just, it's just majority rules when we have a, an internal disagreement. Um, but I've been, I've been in situations where there were difficult disagreements, and that's tricky. That makes it hard. Um, I had some, you know, pretty long and drawn out um, arguments with some folks on, I can think of one show in particular, I'm not going to name any names, but it's, um, but yeah, that can make it hard and that can poison the project. So you kind of need to know who you're going to, who you're working with before you get there. I, I'm sure that's true in any business. I'm sure it's starting any business. It's like that. Mm -hmm. um, I realize there's another question I missed. Um, are there any up and coming filmmakers to watch? Tons. 
Um, I mean, there's so many, you know, I'm always amazed by how many good filmmakers are out there. I mean, this guy, Damien Chazelle's not up and coming, but he's incredible. Um, uh, Greta Gerwig's incredible. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, they're not even up and coming anymore. They're fully <laughs> established. But um, uh, I'm trying to think of like really young filmmakers that I've seen to get back to you on that one. I've been so working on my own. I haven't been watching anyone else's. <laughs> but there's a lot. I mean, it's a good time to be a filmmaker for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of what you've described um, early on in your career is to write um, in order to pro project yourself forward. So what is your writing process and um, what inspires you? Uh, I think, you know, we sort of talk about how there's three drafts that when you write and the first draft is kind of just a, an almost a vomit pass where you don't edit or criticize yourself or compare yourself to Shakespeare or you just don't don't let criticism of the idea stop the idea so just mm -hmm. get it all out on paper even if it doesn't make if it doesn't connect it doesn't make sense and then the second pass is where you start to really shape the bones of the story where you have to throw out some things you really like but they may not fit the overall structure of the story and you sort of refine it that's the heart the second pass is the hardest pass where you really have to make the hard decisions to structure the story. And then the final pass is just the polish. And when you think of it that way, I found it's easier than to try to say, oh, I'm just gonna write it in one shot and be done. So just know the first one is just gonna be a mess and hang in there and keep working through it. Um, uh, and what inspires, inspires you? I mean, it's just butt meets chair. I mean, that's what you have to do. It's like, you can't get sucked down into the, into, in the internet and as, mm -hmm. as, you know, as a way of saying you're doing research or whatever, you, can, you have to be very yeah. honest with yourself. You have to set a goal and say, I'm gonna try to work hard, stick to it and finish it. It's lonely and painful. Writing is lonely and painful. <laughs> uh, great, well, I don't think there are any more questions from the audience. So um, I will uh, flip it back to Michael. Uh, I do see one of your former actors from um, Deceiver has appeared. Stuart, do you, uh, do you have a final He's an amazing. Question? He's an amazing character actor, and he's on vacation in Palm Springs, it looks like. Yeah. Is, that, is that a background, or is that, are those real flowers? Oh, sorry, Helen Stewart. Unmute. Sorry. Go ahead. That's live. I stepped out into a garden for Jonas to uh, get out of a cave, so it didn't look like we were all totally locked up all the time. <laughs> uh, but my brother, I do have a question for you, maybe for the young aspiring filmmakers out there. I've seen you wrestle with it over the last, uh, you know, decade or two. Is where do you strike the line between art and commerce, particularly when you were getting started early on? Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of these folks really wrestle with, you know, should they be going for uh, something that they know is going to propel them forward or something that's going to get them noticed? And how do you strike that balance as you look back over things? You know, that's a, that's a good question, and it's the time-honored balance, and it's been, uh, it's something that every artist wrestles with when they come, when they go to Hollywood, I think. I think when you're first starting out, go for pure art. Show them what you got, because nobody expects it to be a hit, you know? It's more of a showpiece, you know, to say, you know, a lot of great filmmakers have started out because they made a little movie that no one saw, but the industry saw. So at, in the beginning, I would say go for art. And then, I mean, if you look at someone like Woody Allen or even Soderbergh, when they want to make something artistic, they keep the budget down. And, that, and, that, and therefore they get to make their passion projects. When you start coming up with the, you know, Russian Revolution period piece, that's an art project, but it's just going to require an army. Now you're really swimming upstream. So um, it's just a balance. And, you know, every now and then you get, this hasn't happened to me, but it has happened to filmmakers where you've made something commercial and you've got the wind at your back and then you can come back and make something personal like Coran did with Roma. Um, uh, and so, you know, Soderbergh has this joke that he makes one for them and one for himself. And he, he'll make Ocean's Eleven and then he'll go make a movie on an iPhone. Um, and I think that's, that's one way to balance it. It's hard to marry all, to, to be both artistic and wildly commercial at the same time. That's a magic trick. Nice, well certainly looking forward to OBX tonight. Thanks brother. Yeah. All right, with that, um, this has been a lot of fun. Emily, thank you so much for moderating. Um, Emily and I were on a call about another project she's in for a class of mine, and 
this opportunity emerged to have you join our speaker series. And I was like, hey, Emily, you watch Netflix? I was like, yeah, I'm like, great. I was like, I got it. That's yeah. the story of next week. So thank you for your flexibility and for doing this today. It was a lot of fun. Um, we have a session tomorrow um, for anybody who wants to join us on the call at one o'clock. We'll have Andy Flom, who is at Slack. Um, his company was acquired in 2018. Um, so he'll be in our speaker series. And then on Friday at noon, we'll have a session that's part of my Beyond Silicon Valley course about um, supporting entrepreneurship in the crisis. And we're going to talk about the role of nonprofit organizations or NGOs. Jonas, thanks for doing this. Good hey, luck to sure. Outer Banks. Uh, we'll be watching tonight. I hope everybody on this call goes and watches to completion. Watch to completion. Just leave it on in the background. Even if you don't <laughs> want to watch it, just leave it on. I told I told Jonas before, I was like, we're going to see a spike in Netflix metrics from Northeast Ohio. Uh, yeah. For, for Bank, so Netflix will know what happened. I love uh, it. Well, good. Well, thanks for doing this, and it's great to see you, and uh, take care, everybody. Good to see all you guys. Take care. Thank you.